I'm sure uh, many of us would like to go back and read the presentation again in detail because I think it had some fantastic information, especially taking from Pakistan to 27 to 16 uh, by 2050 in terms of purchasing power parity. So thank you so much, uh, um, Shirazi Saab, for a lovely uh, speech. Um, we will now move on to the next uh, part of uh, the conference, the next uh, session, even more interesting. So with the element of nationalism in mind, of course, building Pakistan, thinking about the country, and, and I think before actually moving on in terms of the future, it's best to look at some trends, some history, which we've already done in this session. So now, how do we create the entrepreneurs that Mr. Shiraji spoke about? Whether it's textiles, whether it's in the power sector, whether it's in the SME sector, whether it's exports for Pakistan, whether it's uh, just a better services. How do we create more Kareems and Ubers in Pakistan? There are some fantastic uh, people in the IT space uh, over the last 10 years in Pakistan who are doing wonderful things. The 10 million Pakistanis overseas who are sending close to $20 billion a year, of course, can create $20 billion in Pakistan as well. How do we nurture that kind of talent? How do we maybe nurture that kind of talent in our own homes, uh, in our sons or daughters or, or, or within ourselves? Let's have a discussion with the panel who has done this. I'm I'm going to introduce the chairman of the session, Dr. Muhammad Amjad Sahib. Of course, he will tell you a little bit more about what he has done, being the founder of the Akhuwat Foundation. Dr. Muhammad Amjad Sahib is a development practitioner and a philanthropist. He joined the civil service of Pakistan uh, DMG in 1985 and served at senior positions in the government of Punjab, including the Punjab Rural Support Program, Punjab Middle Schooling Project, and Punjab Health Foundation. I'm sure many of you over here uh, are very familiar with him. Presently, he serves as a consultant at Department for International Development, EDC, and the USAID. Can I please request uh, Dr. Mohammed Andres Sakib to come up on stage? He will be the chairman of the session. I would now uh, like to introduce uh, our panelists. Um, we have Mr. Asif Misbah, the managing director of MACTA International Limited. Mr. Asif Misbah after completing his MBA from uh, the very famous Institute of Business Administration in Karachi in 1993, joined the fam his family business and helped transform MACTA from a so small privately held company to a fast-growing public listed company with 10 billion PKR market cap. Developing a professional management culture, balancing growth, systems development and compliance to develop a reputable corporate brand and the successful family transition from the first to the second generation were some of the key milestones achieved under his leadership. Mr. Asif is a certified director and of course tries to leverage his management experience to contribute towards the development of various NGOs in the health and education sector. Can I please request Mr. Asif Misbah, Managing Director, MACTA International, to keep, please come up on stage. Followed by uh, uh, the President of the Lahore uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Mr. Malik Tahir, Mr. Malik Tahir Javed, uh, can I please request you, sir, to come up on stage. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Mr. Malik Tahir Javed is the Chief Executive of Teal Electronics and Director of MG Industries. Both the companies deal in automotive and tractor parts and electronics. Mr. Malik uh, Tahir Javed is a versatile businessman who has also established himself as an export, exporter and trader of various agri-equipment, particularly in tractor parts. I think that's a fantastic uh, 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 diversified background at the panel already. Uh, he will be joined by Dr. Mohammad Shahriyar Ahmed. Can I please request Dr. Mohammad Shahriyar Ahmed to also come up on stage and take his place uh, on the panel. Um, Dr. Muhammad Shahriyar Shahid is uh, an assistant professor of entrepreneurship at the Suleiman Dao School of Business at LUMS and is also a leading member of the entrepreneurship working group at the university. Dr. Shahid received his PhD from the University of Sheffield in 2011, uh, his MBA from LUMS in 2006 and his bachelor's degree is from GIK, Ulam Isaac Institute of Engineering and Technology in 2003. I think that's some fantastic diversification in your portfolio. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming to ICAP. Um, we will now start the session under the very able leadership of uh, Dr. Saab. Dr. Saab, over to you, sir. Thank you. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Khawatin Azrat, 
طریقہ کار یوں ہے کہ کچھ پانچ چھے منٹ میں میں اس تصور کو آپ کے سامنے پیش کرنے کی کوشش کروں گا اس کے بعد ہمارے معزز پینلسٹ تین سے چار منٹ کی اپنی اوپننگ سٹیٹمنٹس لیں گے پھر میں کچھ سوال ان سے کروں گا اور پھر جسے کہتے ہیں کہ صلاح عام ہے یارانِ نکتہ دان کے لیے فلور ویل بی اوپن آپ سوال پوچھئے جو سوال پوچھتا ہے جواب اسی کو ملتا ہے آخر میں پھر میں اس گفتگو کو سمرائز کرنے کی کوشش کروں گا کہ ہم اپنے دامن میں یہاں سے کیا کچھ باندھ کے لے جا سکتے ہیں تو خواتین حضرات سب سے پہلا سوال یہ ہے کہ انٹرپنیورشپ کیا ہے کوئی جادو ہے کوئی سہر ہے کوئی گورک دھندہ ہے کوئی خواب ہے کوئی امید ہے دنیا انٹرپنیورشپ سے اور انٹرپنیور سے بھری پڑی ہے اتنی بے بہا تصویریں ہیں لیکن اس کے باوجود کوئی ایسا نقش سامنے نہیں آتا کہ جس کے نقوش پر چلتے ہوئے ہم بھی انٹرپنیور بن سکیں انٹرپنیورشپ کوئی نیا افق ہے نئی دنیا ہے نیا جہان ہے انٹرپنیورشپ کریئیٹیوٹی ہے انویشن ہے آؤٹ آف پاکس سلوشن ہے لگے بندھے راستوں سے ہٹ کر کسی نئی منزل کی تلاش ہے میں اکثر کہتا ہوں کہ انٹرپنیور ایک باغی ہے جو یہ کہتا ہے کہ مجھے یہ دنیا قبول نہیں اس میں دکھ ہے اس میں غم ہے اس میں استحصال ہے اس میں افلاس اور محرومی ہے اس میں خواب صرف چند لوگوں کے ہیں اس میں خوشیاں اور مسررتیں اور پھول اور خوشبو سب کے لیے نہیں انٹرپنیور کہتا ہے کہ مجھے یہ دنیا قبول نہیں میں ایک نئی دنیا بناوں گا ایک ایسی دنیا جو سب کے لیے ہو جس میں ہر بچہ سکول جائے ہر ماں کو دوا ملے ہر شخص کو عزت نفس کے ساتھ زندہ رہنے کا موقع ملے خواتین و حضرات انٹرپنیورشپ آسانیاں پیدا کرنے اور آسانیاں تقسیم کرنے کا نام ہے انٹرپنیورشپ ویلیو ایڈیشن ہے انٹرپنیور خدا کے دیئے ہوئے مقاصد کی تکمیل کرتا ہے یہ کائنات یہ پھول یہ کوہ دمن یہ سہرا یہ پہاڑ اتنا کچھ خدا نے دیا انٹرپنیور ان کے حسن و جمال میں اضافہ کرتا ہے انٹرپنیور اس لمحہ کے لیے خود کو تیار کرتا ہے جب کسی بڑی ہستی نے اس سے پوچھنا ہے کہ دنیا میں رہے میرے لیے کیا لے کر آئے کیا تمہارے دامن میں ایسا کوئی پھول ہے جو مجھے پیش کر سکتا خواتین و حضرات انٹرپنیورشپ خوابوں کا عمل ہے تعبیر کا عمل ہے خوابوں سے تعبیر کے سفر کو ممکن بنانے کا نام ہے انٹرپنیورشپ کے لیے ایک مخصوص محول بھی درکار ہے موسم نا مہربان ہو زمین ناسازگار ہو تو انٹرپنیورشپ پنپ نہیں سکتی ایکو سسٹم درکار ہے لوگ ادارے کلچر پالیسی ہیومن ریسورس باہمی مدد تعاون یونیورسٹیز انکیوبیشن سینٹرز یہ تمام ملتے ہیں تو انٹرپنیور جنم لیتے ہیں ایک مخصوص کلچر درکار ہے انٹرپنیورشپ کی فروغ کے لیے اور ایسے لیڈرز کو جنب دینے اور ان کی نشو نما کرنے کے لیے جو ان کے دل پر دستک دے سکتا خواتین و حضرات انٹرپنیورشپ کے انہی مختلف جہتوں پر معزز پینلس گفتگو کریں گے ہو سکتا ہے ہم بھی کوئی ایسی شہ اپنے ساتھ لے کے جائیں جو ہمارے سینے میں بھی اس چنگاری کو ہوا دے ہم بھی انٹرپنیور بن کر آسانیاں پیدا کریں زندگی کو خوبصورت بنائیں انٹرپنیورشپ صرف کاروبار کرنے اور دولت کمانے کا نام نہیں ہے 
इंटरप्रनोर कहता है कि जो दुनिया मुझे मिली मैं उससे खूबसूरत दुनिया छोड़ के जाना चाहता हूँ वो जो किसी ने कहा कि ये मेहर व माह मेरे हम सफ़र रहे बरसों ये मेहर व माह मेरे हम सफ़र रहे बरसों फिर उसके बाद मेरी गर्द को भी पा न सके इंटरप्रन्योर का सफ़र बहुत वसी उफक पर है तो आइए इंटरप्रियोरशिप के बारे में कुछ मज़ीद गुफ्तु इन साहबान से करते हैं जिनमें से कुछ इंटरप्रन्योर हैं और कुछ इंटरप्रन्योर्स को जन्म देने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं बेहद शुक्रिया जैसा हमने अभी इसके टर्म्स तय किए आपसे दरख्वास्त है कि आपने जो इंटरप्रन्योरशिप का सफ़र एक इंडिविजुअल इंटरप्राइज से एक बड़ी कॉरपोरेट तक तय किया उसके बारे में कुछ बताइए और कुछ मज़ीद आप कहना चाहें शुक्रिया so my personal story is uh, spans about 25 years and of being in the family business a family business which was uh, started by my father to the creep and which i joined uh, in 1994 after graduating uh, from the iba so essentially it's a story about a uh, growth um, so the company which was a very small privately held company about uh, shukriya about 2.5 million rupees in sales per annum in 1994 uh, to mashallah now about 4.25 billion rupees and uh, also from a privately held company to a publicly listed company so um, so i think the uh, it it what i'd like to discuss today are some key milestones in this journey of corporatization uh, of of the company um there are three or four uh, uh aspects that i would like to discuss uh the first one was that when i joined the company after my after my graduation it became clear very quickly that the business degree uh, from a very reputable institution did not equip me to manage or run the family business and i think essentially it's because that the business degrees are aimed towards producing uh, managers for large uh, corporate entities and not for uh, small medium size family businesses so i think that is something which was a shock because uh it was a complete uh complete and also i think because we did not have the luxury of working 10 20 years for a corporate entity to get groomed and to get professionally developed that was not that option was not available so we had to join the family business myself and my elder brother who is a chemical engineer and then internally within the organization the internal processes Uh, for development and for grooming do not exist so it was many years of terrible mistakes and huge blunders and it's uh, you know it's a miracle that the company survived us uh, and i think the i think the relevance uh, and what i'd like to connect with the academia is that the uh, the small to medium sized family businesses are very important for any economy and we have lot of those but i think we are failing the the second generations who who uh, join these family businesses by not providing them the right tools and the right skills for them to be successful also i think there's a huge gap for small and medium sized businesses in terms of uh, the mentorship or the uh, or the guidance or advisory that that should be available for them to succeed 
So I think that's, that's, that's an essential learning and uh, I, you know, that's something which I would like to share, especially having Sharia here with us. Um, the first impetus to our corporatization uh, was actually a personal family incident. Uh, the family went through uh, a severe crisis. Um, uh, I was kidnapped for ransom, and it was a terrible time for the family. It was a month-long ordeal. I barely made it back. Uh, but the process actually uh, led the family to, to deeply reflect upon you know, the entity, the family, its values. In that process, we engaged deeply with religion, and that led us to discovering some of the principles and values which were later to define not only us as individuals, but also the business, because all principles and values you know, extend to all spheres of life. So we were lucky in that, and I think that's important because most family businesses will struggle to define and gain consensus on the principles based on which they are going to run their businesses, the principles on which siblings are going to interact with one another, the principles on which uh, the transition from the first generation to the second to the third will take place. So we were very lucky in that. And how it actually uh, impacted uh, our corporatization was that, for example, you know, compliance with tax laws, compliance with legal laws. Now, that was something at that time uh, that if you were to talk to you know, industry colleagues or other businessmen, they would have mixed feelings about that. And most of us would say that this is something uh, which is not advisable and should not be done. It's not practical. You know, there are too many issues. There are, these laws are not practical. Our view was that um, you know, it's, uh, it's part of our uh, religious duty. It has to be done. We have to be compliant with the tax laws and to all laws. And even if we can't do it right now, we must have a process in place to take us there. And so it was a huge discussion in the family. It was a huge discussion going on. Eventually, uh, you know, uh, there was consensus. And alhamdulillah, we moved on that path. And we were able to achieve tax compliance in a short period of time. And similarly for all other laws. So, so it was you know, having strong principles and consensus around those principles, which helped us undertake uh, uh, something which normally, when we look at our peers, we find that that is something which is not generally accepted. So I think that was an important aspect. And I think it's very important for family businesses to define what their core values are and to be consistent with them so that it leads to sustainability and growth for the organization. The second phase, gee, our time here. The second phase of our corporatization was linked to private equity that we invited into the company. So we were sure that we wanted to grow, to be a regional player, to be a global player, and we knew that we would need capital, and we also knew that we would have to do the uh, equity in rounds. But having a financial investor meant that there's going to be uh, uh, board presence, there are going to be reserve matters, there's going to be very close diligence on operations and decision making. And that process, which started about six, seven years ago, was very painful, especially because we were not used to this kind of, uh, uh, these kind of processes, board processes and management processes. And so we needed to get used to it. And also because the performance in the first couple of years was terrible, and that meant that there was a lot of uh, micromanagement, there was a lot of tough discussions, and there was, there was a lot of uh, you know, issues that had to be uh, resolved. But Alhamdulillah. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we, we knew that those were externalities, that the company was fundamentally on the right approach. Uh, the results started to improve. And now as our private equity investors exit, they are, we were the best performing company in their portfolio. So all in all, I think these two, three critical phases help us corporatize the company, help us take it, you know, from a privately held to a publicly listed enterprise. Um, and I'd leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan Saab. Extremely grateful. Taj Saab, you are yourself an entrepreneur and you represent business community. So people are very eager can to, I, you know. Can I go to the podium? Yeah, please.
کو پانچ منٹ سے تک اپنی گفتگو بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I know I have short time, but I'll try to do as much as I can. The year was 1979 when I graduated and uh, we are three brothers in England. And uh, a group from Pakistan comes over and says, we are looking for people, we are looking for entrepreneurs who can come to Pakistan and put up an industry. So we opted for it. We packed up everything. I'm cutting the story short. So we came to Pakistan. They gave us... Uh, two and a half canal uh, space in Kaur Lakhpat industrial area. And uh, we started the process. My brother is a barrister. He also left. My younger brother is an accountant. And uh, we were here to put up an industry in uh, manufacturing a uh, few uh, maybe gas appliances or some other things. So as we came, we uh, needed electricity we constructed there was no problem in constructing because uh, we got the bricks and we got the uh, mud and everything so easily from the market and then we went to uh, we needed uh, uh, electricity so i went to the department and the department demanded the money and the barista shop said no i will not pay any bribe so the first hurdle was that we had to wait for about uh, one and a half year because my brother and SDU at that time, there was a tug of war between them. My brother said, you have to install it. I'm an expert. It. I came here. I left everything. He says, no, this is the culture of Pakistan. You must pay me the money. Otherwise, you will never get the connection. So after one and a, year, one and a half year, he gave up and we got the connection. So now, um, going after it's been 38 years, we've had a, a great success in Pakistan. I don't have uh, uh, any, any problem, I, I'm doing pretty well. But I just like to tell you, I'm going back a little. So when uh, we constructed the factory, we started the business, there were so many problems we faced. Uh, we used to sit in the office and uh, people from the different departments used to come and haunt us. For example, the Social Security, the EOBI, um, and then I counted at that time there were about 47 different departments. That time we also have passed and then I entered the uh, basically uh, politics of uh, business because I thought this was maybe the best way I could help our business community and uh, I wanted to do a lot for them and then uh, I realized I think even the Lahore Chamber of Commerce most of the people are going through the same problems that I went through and almost every day I receive so many complaints about the department. Departments are still there. Of course, I progress my business, but um, 47 year, uh, 40 years of uh, industrialization in Pakistan, I think nothing has changed. Departments are still there. The mindset of the bureaucracy is still there. The objections and the obstacles are still there for the inter uh, entrepreneurs. And um, I made a slogan, I said, until and unless you have respect for the traders, you, you have a respect for the industry, you have a respect for the local investors, and you have respect for the expatriates. And I've said a lot in these four things only. If you study this carefully, you will see there is a, uh, there is a lot involved into that. And uh, we talked about ease of doing business. Well done, bureaucracy of Pakistan. We, we went up from 143 to 147. Our stage went up, and I had a Nigerian ambassador in Lahore Chamber. He came up, and I said, uh, how is the ease of doing business in your country? He said, well, Mr. President, we have come down from 169 to 143, Niger Nigeria. It's a, a recorded fact. So, unless and until we don't do some ease of doing business, enterprises can never progress in Pakistan. I say this right in front of, open in front of you, because uh, we have hurdles in almost everything that we have to uh, uh, go and get opted for. And uh, apart from that, I just like to say something about the FTA here. Uh, Lahore Chamber opted for it, we went to Islamabad and we stopped it. 18 billion dollars of deficit, we stopped it because uh, the, uh, the government was going to sign this and Lahore Chamber went there, we cried and uh, I'm thankful to the Ministry of Commerce, I'm thankful to the uh, Customs Department, 
I made them realize. I made them a paper. I told them that this is the this is the kind of losses that you will have. And they realized the prime minister at the last minute of the signing of the contract, he he gave up and he said, uh, "No, I think uh, uh, this please. is the time." Would you like to conclude? Okay. So basically, um, I can talk a lot on enterprise because I'm an enterprise myself. But sir, I like to conclude on saying one thing: if us and the government and the tripartite don't come together, enterprise will never survive. I will tell you why. Today you have seen this in your GDP. Only 10 years ago, you, your industry was 21.75, your agriculture was 21 point, and services were 57. As Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, the, the speaker said here, that the services don't provide so many jobs that the industry does. Enterprises is in there, and you need to find the way out. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you very much. So from a practitioner towards a, a teacher and academician, so Sharia Saab, will you please enlighten us? Hello. Uh, I think, Dr. Uh, Saab, thank you so much. You have a very beautiful definition of entrepreneur. I wish I could record it and uh, use it for, uh, for later purposes. Uh, I think I would not, uh, I would hold on to some of my comments about the ecosystem because we are going to discuss uh, more specifically about those uh, factors later on in the discussion. But I would like to use this time to at least state the problem with the ecosystem that we have. So problem statement is very important, but I, uh, how I see it. Uh, but this is where I would like to pick up uh, on what Shirazi Saab said. Um, Charles Dickin, uh, it was worst of the times and it was best of the times. This is exactly the the kind of time we need for entrepreneurship to flourish. And uh, this is exactly the kind of uh, period that the Pakistani entrepreneurial ecosystem is going through. So while there are good news, uh, there are bad news as well. Uh, by the virtue of my profession, I'm very deeply embedded into the startup ecosystem out there, right? Uh, be it incubation centers, be it investor summits, be it uh, universities, etc. Uh, so one thing I can guarantee you or I can ascertain you is that over the last eight years, since 2010, Pakistan ka entrepreneurial system has gone through a remarkable growth and remarkable improvement in all areas. One very tangible indicator of that fact is the number of startups that we have produced over the last eight years. Uh, according to a rough estimate, uh, around 750 startups uh, have graduated from the different incubation centers that we have in Pakistan since 2010. And collectively, they have managed to raise the investment of more than $10 million from different uh, investors locally and internationally. Uh, so such are the indicators. Um, but uh, I think that's not the problem anymore. The problem uh, of the entrepreneurial ecosystem is the survival rate of these startups. Uh, so while our ecosystem has nurtured, has matured a lot in terms of producing startups, it has terribly failed to sustain these startups. Uh, very few of them have managed to sustain, and those who manage to sustain somehow, they tend to stagnate. So there is not a lot of shift happening from micro to small and then small to medium and then medium to large enterprises in Pakistan. So this is where the entrepreneurial ecosystem has not delivered as it should have. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Okay, while it's very conducive to create startups, it's not very conducive for those startups to grow. Uh, so yes, there are, uh, there are many loose bricks in the ecosystem that we will talk about. Uh, so there are regulatory issues, uh, there are issues related to the um, trust of investors, 
uh, investors are still not investing in startups in the Pakistani ecosystem uh, because of certain regulatory loopholes that we have. Um, and then the culture, uh, the society as a whole, entrepreneurship uh, is yet not very well received in the society as a profession. Uh, let alone the society out there. So it's changing, but still uh, it, it needs more structured efforts to, ch to bring that change. And so one last thing, I think this is the platform for me to say this up front, Gabe. Um, while I happen to visit so many incubators and while I happen to teach so many youngsters, uh, what I see is that accountants, you know, since it's their platform, it's their show, I mean, they are relatively uh, underrepresented uh, at all these platforms as opposed to uh, business management students or the engineers. So it's very rare that I come across uh, a young accountant being incubated somewhere and trying to bring some value proposition, some disruption, uh, some disruptive idea to the society out there. Uh, whereas they are one of the most, uh, I would say, you guys are entrepreneurs um, by nature, by the virtue of the, by the design of the education that you receive. Uh, nobody can understand risk better than an accountant. So uh, they are the best people to manage risk, to categorize risk. Uh, nobody should be better than you in terms of make decision making. And uh, most importantly, accountants are the most trusted people out there for some reason. You know, you want to raise investment, you tell the investor man, accountant, suddenly there is this trust factor developed as opposed to an engineer telling an investor that I need investment. So, so I think then, Dr. yeah, so I, I'll conclude yeah. and we will move on with the discussion. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Dr. Shah, for all the panelists gave brilliant opening statements. Uh, I will request one question from each panelist and then I will request the audience. So, Asif Saab, you have just uh, one thing, then you know, your story has been a remarkable story, journey from an individual enterprise to a big corporation. You have mentioned very briefly about the role of faith. I would like you to, you know, uh, throw some light that how faith helps improve an entrepreneur. Would you like to give some of your thoughts on this? What is the relationship between faith and entrepreneurship? Take it. Yeah, uh, in tremendous ways, in, in, many, in many aspects. Uh, one, obviously, it, I think it helps us to define why we are in business. And so when you have a clear purpose, and many studies now show that purpose-driven organizations tend to do better, so I think you get a very good, uh, you know, you get help and facilitation in deriving your purpose. So for, for our, in our case, the purpose was, number one, to, for the business to be a means for earning a, a halal livelihood, halal. right? So that's a basic fundamental purpose. The other purpose was to help alleviate suffering by, by treating diseases. Third was uh, to, to provide a platform for the development of our people because professionals tend to spend a large part of their lives in the workplace. So how are we facilitating their intellectual, their economic, and their spiritual development? Um, it also, in terms of values of a leader, because I think one of the greatest challenges that we see today also is uh, that leaders and their leadership values, um, greed, um, corruption, are some of the key issues which plague uh, uh, modern corporations because the person at the top has betrayed the trust of the shareholders. So I think that the grounding in terms of values, in terms of purpose, which a person may find through religion, uh, can play an instrumental role. Thank you very much, uh, Asif Saab. Uh, I asked specifically this question because we are a faith-based community and faith uh, 
plays a very, very critical and dominant role in our shaping of ideas, in our practices. So thank you very much, you know, you derive inspiration from the moral principles as enunciated in uh, your faith. Thank you very much. Tahir Sahib, you talked about uh, making your contribution uh, for the business community. My question to you is that uh, how uh, your institution, the Chamber of Commerce, is helping nurture new entrepreneurs? Uh, we have 125 different committees in uh, Lahore Chamber. And we have committees on SMEs, committees on uh, uh, middle class enterprise, we have uh, committees on large uh, enterprise. We have a lot of uh, uh, functions and we have a lot of seminars of uh, teaching uh, the business uh, people. They come to the uh, Lahore Chamber. We have endless seminars and we try to educate. That is uh, one sector. Uh, we try to um, uh, tell them how to get through with these problems but the problem is the instability you know uh, the instability is creating a lot of problem for the enterprise because when an enterprise starts a business he starts uh, by having uh, his own money and the banks are not friendly with the uh, enterprise they do not give them the loans just like that for example you start a business and you need to have uh, some uh, loans from the banks, the, uh, the, it is cumbersome. I think uh, a lot of charter accountants are sitting here. They know and they understand. And that is also we are preaching that the government should simplify uh, that system uh, for the enterprise and let them, uh, and the ease of doing business. I'll keep on saying this again and again because unless and until you, and we preach for that to the government, we try to negotiate and talk with the government that you should do away these hurdles and you should bring down the position. If you don't do this, your enterprise uh, cannot survive for long, you know? So this is Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry, we have to move um, forward. So, Dr. Shab, as an academician, you have, you know, touched upon various subjects. So, first question would be that, uh, are you satisfied that as an academician or a representative of academia, is, uh, are the entire universities, the various incubation centers, are they playing their positive role? Are they making some difference? And how would you link this with uh, the culture of promotion or risk taking in our society? Uh, right, I think being an academic, um, yes, I truly believe that universities are making a lot of difference now. Uh, but yes, there is still a lot of uh, work to be done in terms of the training model that we use. So, what was a question hota tha ki are entrepreneurs born or made? Can entrepreneurship be taught or not? It has proven to be a myth. Yes, entrepreneurs can certainly be made and one can certainly teach somebody to become an entrepreneur. And this is where universities can make a lot of difference. However, now the question is not whether we can teach entrepreneurship. The question is how should we teach entrepreneurship? So, you know, are teaching somebody management versus somebody accountancy or engineering is very different ball game than teaching somebody um, entrepreneurship. Uh, so yes, they are making a difference and we cannot underrate the rate a university can play in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. One classic example of this is the Silicon Valley. You know, uh, this term was coined by the Silicon Valley when we say entrepreneurial ecosystem, the first thing that comes to our mind is the Silicon Valley. Uh, how many of you know the root of the Silicon Valley? The root of the Silicon Valley is Stanford University. Had there been no Stanford, there would have been no Silicon Valley at all. The, the, uh, the, the seed was germinated by the Stanford University. And precisely, Frederick Terman, the professor, the dean of the School of Electrical Engineering at Stanford, 70 years ago, is, is now known as the father of the Silicon Valley. So, so we have classic examples where that establishes the importance of academia in setting up this ecosystem for us. Hopefully, we will see many such instances in Pakistan as well. Thank you very much, uh, the panelists. Uh, Time is short, but I will encourage one or two questions from the audience. Uh, please uh, stand up, have a very precise question, uh, no comments please, and uh, you may like to address any of the panelists uh, standing in front of, uh, sitting in front of you.
Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you very much for the great presentations and uh, for your great success stories. My question is that as an accountant who has been trained and qualified as an accountant working as CFO of one of the companies, how does this topic relate to my job or what I should be thinking towards moving towards this entrepreneurship? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shab, if you would like to answer this question, how does an accountant's job relate to ecosystem and entrepreneurship? Right. I think... Um, there is a lot one can deliver to an accountant when it comes to entrepreneurship. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, aapko dekhne entrepreneurship exactly kya? To me, entrepreneurship is a mindset, right? Uh, whether you are working for your own self or you are working in a company, there is something that we call an entrepreneurial mindset. The mindset to take um, an initiative in the face of uncertainty. Uh, it's the mindset to think out of the box. It's the mindset to uh, to to bring disruption uh, to how things are done at the moment, and then I think uh, f an accountant, as an accountant, you are tailor made to be an entrepreneur, right? Uh, because I personally believe there is nobody better prepared than an accountant to be an entrepreneur. You guys have the ability to know the business inside out, irrespective of the type of business you are talking about. Um, you know, you again, risk identification, risk measurement, decision making, um, uh, what not. Uh, analytical skills is something which is already uh, an integral part of uh, your training as an accountant. Uh, and now we, we do have many startups like uh, uh, being initiative by accountants. I know how many of you have heard of this text Dosti initiative that is coming out these days. It's a venture by a chartered accountant. Uh, we have TurboJet, we have TextFile, all these startups are coming out from accountants. Uh, and then you guys have this credibility attached to you that you can definitely uh, leverage on. So you can encash that credibility that comes with an accountant versus an engineer or a management student. Um, so, so that's, that's my Sir. view on that. Uh, yeah, you can add, uh, uh, Asif sir wants to add a sentence. Oh, please. Um, our entire uh, corporatization process and uh, our transition uh, was spearheaded by our CFO. And so from that point of view, our success, you know, as a family business and now, you know, to a publicly held company, was led by a strong, competent, ethical uh, individual who was process driven and was committed to, you know, bring about that transformation. So, so you know, it's a, I think for, for businesses, for entrepreneurs, the right professionals, especially the CFOs, are key. I think, uh, sorry, please, no, sorry. Please. Uh, this is the thing I want to say that the uh, enterprise and the accountants they have a very close relationship. I personally think a good accountant can stare out the company um, out of crisis, and I think the, um, the both of them should be highly professional, right. and they should help each other, and they should be uh, teaching each other as well, because I think the accountant, if he tells the proper uh, things to the enterprise that you can do this, you can't do this, I think uh, um, it's a very good question, and I think uh, we should uh, basically work on this topic, that how do we br bridge the gap? Because most of, most of the businessmen, they are not understanding sometimes. And all we know is the in income tax department and the charter accountant and the business, so we need to bring that thing together. That is what we are trying to do in uh, Lahore Chamber. We are having seminars. We are having Thank programs. you very much, uh, Tahar Sahib. I think um, uh, Dr. Sahib like to add one thing? Very quickly, look, I have a surprised I am surprised to see that accountants ki representation jo hai to all these well, they are not very well connected with the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, so ye, it's a personal initiative. You need to get out of the office and you need to connect with the ecosystem out there. Uh, there are lo a, lot of, a lot happening about entrepreneurship, many conferences, talks, seminars, incubations, but it's very rare that you come across an account accounting student or an accountant being part of uh, all these platforms. So, अगर आपने फायदा लेना है entrepreneurship से, चाहे accountant है या lawyer है या engineer है, you need to connect yourself with the 
ایکو سسٹم فرسٹ آف آل سو پھر نیچرلی بینیفٹ آپ پہ ٹرکل ڈاؤن ہونا اسٹارٹ ہو جائے گا سو تھینک یو ویری مچ ڈاکٹر صاحب آئی مائی سیلف آئی ایم سوشل انٹرپرینیور اینڈ آئی ایم ایکسٹریملی امپریس بائی دی کانٹریبیوشن میڈ بائی اکاؤنٹینٹس ٹو نو ہیلپ اس گرو اینڈ گو ٹو ڈفرینٹ ہورائزنس اینی وے آل دس دیز آنسرز فرام آور پینلس وڈ ہیو بین میوزک ٹو دی ایئرس آف آور اکاؤنٹینٹس that how important they are in nurturing and promoting entrepreneurship. The last question, sir. Yes, Assalamu alaikum ji. My relationship with media, I didn't get any news from the morning. I was in three hours. I didn't get any news from the Malak Sahib. The Malak Sahib gave me a lot of news. I would like to tell you that the chief financial officers of our chief financial officers, if they don't get the politicians with these politicians, پبلک پرائیویٹ سیکٹر میں جو بھی خرابیاں ہوتی ہیں تو کیا آپ سمجھتے ہیں کہ پاکستان میں پبلک اور پرائیویٹ سیکٹرز میں جہاں پہ گڈ گورننس کے ایشوز ہیں ان میں ون آف دا جو فیلئر ہے وہ ہمارے چیف فائنینشل آفیسرز کنسرن ہیں وہ بھی ایک خرابی کا باعث ہیں ملک صاحب اگر آپ جو آپ دے دیں تو خبر بن جائے گی ہماری نہیں بیسکلی یو ٹچ دی ویری سینسٹیو ٹاپک Basically, public-private, uh, this is what we are, uh, um, this is the biggest problem that I think uh, our country is going through uh, because uh, public is on this side and private, you know, um, that is something we need to bring a gap in. And I think uh, the tripartite committees that the government tries to make, for example, with the FBR, with the, with the uh, uh, chambers and the uh, uh, professional people, I, I, I have been the part of that and I think uh, government is trying but still as I said that before that the instability of the economical policies One day it's uh, the dollar is at 105 and the ne next day the dollar is at 116. Our commerce industry, our uh, finance uh, um, our people, they are not understanding and this is what I'm trying to tell them every day. Wake up. History will never forgive you in the future because the way you are spending, you are wasting time of the public and the time that you are wasting uh, for the uh, poor people, one day you will have a severe uh, consequences. So that is what I'm saying every day in the Lahore Chamber. Thank you very much. Thank I you hope very I much, answered sir. you. Thank you very much, sir. I think I should conclude your سو تھینک یو ویری مچ ڈسٹنگوشڈ پینلسٹ خواتین حضرات آپ نے بہت اچھی باتیں سنی اور کچھ ریلیونس تلاش کرنے کی کوشش کی کہ ایک سی ایف او اس پورے انٹرپرینیوریل ایکو سسٹم میں اپنے کردار کو کس طرح ڈیفائن کر سکتا ہے تو چند باتیں جو میں نے سیکھیں ڈاک شاپ نے کہا کہ کلچر کا بہت اہم تعلق ہے ایک مائنڈ سیٹ ہے انٹرپنیوریل جرنی جو ہے یا انٹرپنیورشپ جو ہے یہ ایک مائنڈ سیٹ ہے یہ ایک غیر یقینی صورتحال کا سامنا کرنے کی